thank you very much. I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful conference, celebrating uh, Boris's 60th birthday and his wonderful achievements in physics. Um, like many speakers before me, I was um, fortunate to experience Boris's inspirational influence and mentorship. In my case, I was lucky to have been his PhD students. Um, but it was probably unique, uh, the only one maybe here, to have taken a course by Boris. And I want to say, Boris, that it was the best course I've taken in my life. And as I said it before, I thought I'd use the opportunity to do it. So I want to wish you not only many more years of productive research, but also of um, inspiring and teaching new generations of physicists. Thank you. And so now uh, I'll turn to the subject of my talk. <clears throat> Uh, so I will present a work uh, that was done together with Igor Alejner and Valery Vinokur. And uh, I am very happy that it actually builds on the work by Boris Altshuler, Arkady Aronov, uh, and Boris Pivak, uh, which predicted the existence of aronov bohm oscillations in disordered uh, metallic cylinders. So in this work, we show that uh, aronov bohm oscillations exist not only uh, in conductors with holes, such as cylinders or rings, uh, but also in singly connected conductors. Uh, so uh, the phenomena I will be discussing are rooted in quantum coherence of electron motion, uh, which plays a very important role in disordered conductors. Probably the most uh, profound phenomenon that follows from quantum coherence is Anderson localization, uh, which occurs in strongly disordered samples where the mean free path is shorter than the uh, Fermi wavelength of electrons. Uh, and in the opposite weakly disordered metallic regime, um, electron motion at the Fermi level is semi-classical. And so uh, basically, most of the transport phenomena can be understood classically, whereas quantum coherence results only in small corrections, which are small as, uh, uh, oops, sorry, uh, small in 1 over KFL. Uh, and for that reason, even long after uh, Anderson's discovery of localization, it was believed that one can basically neglect quantum corrections in metals. But that changed with the advent of mesoscopic physics, of which Boris is a founding father. So in the late uh, 70s and 80s, people uh, realized that although these quantum corrections are small, they're also very sensitive to uh, external magnetic fields and temperature. And as a result, they actually dominate temperature and magnetic field dependencies of physical properties of disordered metals. And so there are many uh, spectacular phenomena that arise from quantum coherence. Uh, here, is, uh, here are a few examples. Um, negative magnetic resistance at small fields, um, aronov bohm oscillations of, uh, in metallic cylinders and rings, and the universal conductance fluctuations. All of them bear Boris's name. Uh, and in the, talk will, in the work I will present today, we are building on uh, this second topic, on Boris's work with Arkady Aronov and Boris Spivak. So um, aronov bohm oscillations uh, mean that um, properties of conductors depend non-monotonically as a function of the external flux through the system. So if you apply a flux phi, uh, the dependence of physical properties is monotonic, uh, non-monotonic and oscillatory. And probably the first discussion of um, aronov bohm oscillations in metals was made by Bogacic, uh, who considered clean metallic cylinders. And he showed that if you apply a magnetic field along the axis of the cylinder, then um, its properties will oscillate as a function of the flux uh, with the oscillation period uh, given by Hc over E. And in this case, the oscillations arise from um, uh, the semi-classical electron trajectories in the whispering gallery mode. So that's a picture pulled from Wikipedia showing uh, the acoustic pressure profile in the whispering gallery mode at St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, and so because of uh, uh, this reliance on um, kind of creation integrability, these oscillations are actually very sensitive to disorder, and they are destroyed upon, by disorder averaging. But they occur not only in conductors with holes, but also in singly connected conductors. Uh, and then uh, Boris, uh, in this work with Arkady Aronov and Boris Pivak, showed that even in disordered conductors, there are aronov bohm oscillations which are not, uh, not washed out by disorder. They have a different physical origin. They arise from quantum interference corrections. 
they have the uh, different oscillation period given by you know, double the electron charge. Uh, and they survive disorder averaging. Uh, but in this work, uh, it was, uh, what was considered are uh, essentially very thin cylinders where uh, one could neglect uh, the flux of the magnetic field through the sample and only consider the flux through the hole. Um, uh, and so what uh, we showed in this work is that our own bomb oscillations also exist in solid conductors, singly, without, without holes. Uh, the oscillation period is also given by a tw the Cooper pair ch charge, twice electron charge. They survive disorder averaging. And uh, what I will try to show is that th these oscillations arise for also from in quantum interference corrections, but due to a special class of uh, disordered diff diffusive electron trajectories, uh, which are near the sample boundary. So the main, uh, probably physical point uh, of conclusion of this work is that magnetic field affects quantum interference corrections in the bulk and near the surface in a different way. And this different um, difference in the way the quantum interference corrections are suppressed allows one to separate uh, the bulk contribution to quantum interference corrections from the surface contribution. And uh, the aronov bomb oscillations arise from this surface contribution. So, uh, no, uh, let me just qualitatively discuss the origin of the effect. Uh, the sensitivity of quantum interference corrections to a magnetic field is described by the Couperon. That's kind of the main object of the theory. Uh, and the Couperon uh, describes um, interference of um, Feynman amplitudes of time reversed paths, connecting points R1 and R2. And in terms of uh, semi classical trajectories, and can, it can be written as a sum over the classical trajectories. Here, W sub L is the probability of realization of a given path. And the influence of the magnetic field is uh, described by this uh, phase factor. So theta is the uh, aronov bomb phase accumulated by the electron as it moves along the classical trajectory. And so uh, at zero magnetic field, the phase factor goes to unity, and this corresponds to constructive interference between uh, time-reversed paths. But at a finite magnetic field, uh, this phase factor starts oscillating, and le this leads to suppression of quantum interference corrections in a magnetic field. And so uh, the, uh, one can actually express this aronov bomb phase in terms of the oriented area uh, which is confined between the electron trajectory, shown here, and the straight line connecting the endpoints of the Couperon. Uh, and so, you know, and so the, these oriented areas fluctuate, and the, uh, so the statistics of these oriented areas measured in units of the magnetic length describe the suppression of the quantum interference corrections. Uh, and it turns out that the statistics of these oriented areas are different uh, in the bulk and near the boundary. Uh, the difference arises because the, in the bulk, when both points are f uh, far from the boundary, uh, the uh, summation over paths is unrestricted. And so we take the functional integral over all diffusive paths and uh, compute statistics. And this results in the Gaussian dependence of the Couperon on the distance between the two points. But near the boundary, there is a hard wall geometrical constraint on the allowed trajectories. Uh, and as a result, if you uh, want to find how the Couperon falls off with the distance at large distances, you can take this functional integral by saddle point. And just like in analysis, the saddle point can lie in the middle of the integration region or near the boundary. In this case, it lies sort of near the boundary in the functional space. And this results, first of all, in the exponential decay of the Couperon with the uh, distance between the endpoints, not Gaussian. And the second important um, uh, distinction is that the non-random part of the phase uh, is measured along the boundary because the, the boundary, uh, sorry, the, the optimal trajectory uh, hugs the, the boundary. And so this, uh, the phase should be measured uh, should, along the boundary of the sample. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, if we take a, a Couperon uh, at distances larger than the magnetic length, what we see is that uh, the surface contribution to the Couperon becomes much larger than the bulk contribution because uh, instead of a ga uh, Gaussian decay, we get an exponential decay. 
And uh, this is similar to the enhancement or surface enhancement of electron tunneling in strong magnetic fields uh, um, discussed by uh, Hayetsky and Shklovsky. Uh, but uh, this similarity is formal because we are not dealing with the uh, tunneling regime. We are dealing with semi-classical corrections. Uh, and uh, because the Couperon obeys the same Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation as a particle tunneling electron in a magnetic field, we get uh, the same uh, kind of formal formal similarity. So, um, uh, so as a result, if you take, uh, for example, two points of the Couperon somewhere near the boundary, uh, the, uh, this Couperon is dominated by, not by going through the bulk, diffusion through the bulk, but rather by uh, uh, kind of diffusive trajectories which um, um, graze the sample boundary. And so what one can get from between the two points going by, let's say, counterclockwise or clockwise, and the two, interference the two amplitudes interfere. And this results in the oscillatory de dependence of the Couperon on the flux, total flux through the system. So for example, uh, a Couperon at coinciding points uh, will contain some non-oscillatory contribution and also an oscillatory contribution which will oscillate with the flux and the period of the oscillations corresponds to the superconducting uh, flux quantum. Uh, and the amplitude of these oscillations is um, exponentially suppressed in the length of the perimeter of the boundary, P, uh, but exponentially not in the Gaussian way. Okay, so how can we um, understand this uh, in a quantitative treatment, the origin of the oscillations? We can uh, write the Couperon uh, formally in terms of the eigenvalues um, of the Schrodinger equation in a magnetic field and eigenfunctions in this form. Uh, and the boundary condition that should be imposed on the Couperon corresponds to the vanishing of the normal component of the current. So it differs from the boundary conditions for electrons. Uh, and uh, so below I will uh, consider the simplest example of a two-dimensional disk, although the conclusions uh, are very general and independent of the shape of the sample. So in the case of a disk, uh, the uh, eigenvalues of the Cooper problem can be labeled by two quantum numbers, the Landau level index and the angular momentum. So we can just formally write the Couperon as a sum over uh, the Landau level index, which is denoted by n, and the angular momentum m. And so the wave functions are known. And uh, it's convenient to introduce dimensionless uh, eigenvalues, which are uh, measured the units of the Landau level spacing of, of this problem. And so, uh, um, so, each Landau, so if the angular momentum of m is small, so that the Landau orbital lies entirely in the interior of the sample, then the Landau level spectrum is flat. And it's plotted here. So if, okay. So what's plotted here is um, uh, this dimensionless eigenvalues of the Cooper problem as a function of the angular momentum. So the uh, small angular momentum correspond to the left part of the graph but as the angular momentum increases and the Landau orbital starts approaching uh, the boundary of the sample, the degeneracy of the Landau level is broken. And uh, importantly, uh, the, the, uh, the level, so the spectrum doesn't just turn up, but experiences a dip. Uh, and uh, so this dip occurs for angular momenta uh, approximately equal to the uh, dimensionless flux through the sample. Um, uh, and so the, the dip in the spectrum uh, is what, what is responsible for the appearance of superconductivity in a magnetic field first near the boundary. And so this is the lowest, uh, lowest angular value of the Couperin problem, and then it spreads into the bulk uh, at higher fields. Uh, and um, in our case, uh, so the, the oscillations uh, arise uh, for the following reason. That, so the, as you change the flux in the system, this um, minimum of the spectrum uh, corresponding to M star shifts, I would say, right to left. And so these quantized, uh, um, uh, quantized eigenvalues traverse the minimum. And as a result of this traversal, uh, this 
all properties of the system oscillate with a flux uh, in the units of the superconducting flux quantum. And uh, so using this, we can just uh, analyze the Couperon um, near the boundary at large uh, separations, uh, angular separations. And um, at large separations, the fall of the Couperon is dominated by the minimum of the spectrum here. And the, one can get this uh, expected exponential decay of the Couperon with the distance. Okay, and so what, does it, what are the implications of these uh, uh, findings for uh, physical observables? So let us consider as an example um, uh, fluctuation correction uh, to the free energy of a superconductor in a magnetic field. And again, I want to stick to the example of a solid disk in two dimensions. So uh, the fluctuation corrections are well, well known. Uh, one can find this formula, for example, in the review by uh, Boris and Arkady Aronov. Um, and so what's important for me is that this correction depends only on the spectrum of the Couperon and not the shape of the uh, eigenfunctions. So for these two-dimensional disks, um, we just here express the correction in terms of the dimensionless eigenvalues of the Couperon. And so this, in this expression, K is the Matsubara frequency index, and N and M are the Landau level index and the angular momentum. And so now if you uh, know the spectrum, you, you get you know, the, the fluctuation correction. So if you uh, approximate this, this sum over the quantum uh, eigenvalues as uh, in a kind of a leading approximation, as the area of the sample times the density of states for the Landau levels, you don't get the oscillations, that you get the bulk contribution uh, to this fluctuational correction. Uh, but if you uh, actually treat the sum exactly, it's the difference between the sum and this uh, integral approximation gives you the surface contribution, and in particular, the Aronov bomb oscillations. So uh, how do they um, come up? So you, you can uh, simplify uh, this general expression near the upper critical field, HC3. And so using the Poisson summation formula, uh, we can get the, the, the simpler expression for the oscillatory part of the free energy. Uh, so you can see that the amplitude of the uh, different Fourier harmonic, uh, they decay exponentially with the perimeter of the boundary, P. Uh, but the... Uh, characteristic length of this exponential decay is given by uh, the coherence length uh, for superconducting fluctuations uh, near the boundary. And this length diverges at the upper critical field, H surface critical field, HC3. So they, uh, these fluctuations need not be small. Uh, and this uh, hyperbolic cotangent describes the crossover between uh, fluctuational regime dominated by classical fluctuations, zero Matsubawa frequency, or quantum fluctuations. And so these oscillations can, in principle, be measured in experiment by, uh, uh, by measuring pers persistent currents. Uh, but of course, they should exist not only in thermodynamic quantities, but also in transport. And for example, uh, aslamazov larkin corrections in singly connected uh, superconductors above uh, the um, upper critical field should also uh, give rise to uh, of bone oscillations and can be measured, for example, in the fourth terminal geometry following this paper. Uh, and finally, I'd like to just mention that um, um, these uh, oscillatory flux dependence of uh, transport properties of conductors, of singly connected conductors, has been observed in several experiments. So notably, there was a, um, an experiment published in 2005 from the group of um, Dani Shahar, uh, and also a later work uh, from Nina Markovich's group at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, so which saw um, oscillatory flux dependence of resistance of uh, superconducting wires in the normal state. Uh, there was a, a, a theoretical work by uh, David Pecker, uh, Gil Rafael, and Paul Goldberg, which attributed these oscillations to formation of uh, vortices uh, inside these um, wires, uh, and in terms of repulsion of these uh, discrete vortices. And so they called it Weber blockade. 
And so in this work, what we showed is that the oscillatory dependence on the flux through the system of various properties is uh, a much more general phenomenon. It does not require formation of uh, vortices. It exists even when there is no uh, mean field order parameter in the system. And uh, in this case, oscillations arise from quantum interference corrections. And so uh, I think that's it. I, so in conclusion, um, we've shown that the oscillations exist in singly connected conductors. They arise uh, from a quantum interference corrections due to a special class of trajectories that graze the sample boundary. They are especially pronounced in superconducting samples in the normal state and diverge near the uh, surface critical field HC3. And if you uh, uh, consider general three-dimensional samples with or without holes, then uh, each, um, uh, each maximal or extremal uh, cross-section of the sample normal to the field contributes an oscillation period. Thank you for, very much for your attention.